Welcome to Intersections, an Avondale Originals podcast. Bringing together the most intriguing people from entrepreneurs to explorers, we dive in to find their common intersections and provoke elevated conversations. Follow along as we discuss life, business, fast cars, and everything in between. In this episode of Intersections, we bring together two influential women and leaders in our community, Krista Brown Sanford, partner and deputy chair of the Intellectual Property Department at Baker Botts LLP, and Jenna Owens, founder of Fittish and former radio host, to share their stories, career journeys, and the most impactful lessons learned along the way. As you listen, you'll find that they both reference pursuing careers, partnerships, and community collaborations that truly personify and enrich their authentic self. The vehicles featured in this episode are the Maserati Quattro Porte and the Mercedes-Benz AMG GT43, courtesy of Avondale dealerships. Jenna and Krista excitedly meet at the Olana, a 48,000 square foot venue located in Hickory Creek, Texas, a perfect setting for an elevated conversation. I'm excited to check this I'm house out. I'm so excited out. too. It is gorgeous. Wow. So this is like 45,000 square feet outside of my Zillow budget. Yeah. Seriously. <laughs> I mean, let's just take a moment. Look at this amazing chandelier. There's a mural up there. This is absolutely gorgeous. I know, I can't wait to learn a little bit about this from you today because you uh, started a side hustle some years ago, right? Where you actually build houses. That's right. In yes. all of your free time. Yeah. My side hustle is really my passion. You know, I love going into blank spaces and creating something new. Usually go in and I can see it before it's done, right? right? And when it's in my head, I feel like I have to get it out. Have you ever built anything like this? Well, not <laughs> quite. <laughs> it's kind of amazing though, because it's kind of like Belle's Castle, right? Like the Beauty and the Beast, but then there's cows outside. I know, <laughs> who would have thought we would have found this? Yeah, it's stunning. So what car did you drive in today? So I drove a Maserati Quattro Porte today, which was awesome. I'm in one of my favorite cars I've ever been in because it's like a sedan, but incredibly sporty. It's the Mercedes-Benz GT. I absolutely love it. It's so fast and so sporty. You know, I don't know if you know this, probably not, but I've been partnering with Avondale. It's just one of the many perks of working on the radio That's for so nice. many years. But I just love their fleet, you know, the offering, because, you know, for now I can try and get in some sexy, sporty cars. And then at some point I'm going to need a little more of a mom mobile. But they have such amazing cars to choose from. So I'm so interested to learn about your career trajectory because I think that you've accomplished more than most women have in their lifetime already. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's just really fascinating to think you've kind of been a trailblazer, right, in terms of how did you get your start? With engineering? Is that what you did at first? I did. But the funny thing is I'm a bit of an anomaly. Um, I knew I wanted to be a patent attorney at 12. And I told my mom, I want to be a lawyer. You know, I watched the Cosby show, wanted to be like Claire Huck but I was good in math and science. And my mom said, Krista, you need to be a patent attorney. So at 12, I set my sights on getting on this track to become a patent attorney. So I did electrical engineering in college, went straight to law school. And then after law school, I started at the law firm. Now, even though I started so long ago, I thought I'll just practice for a year and then go and work at my dad's company. Yeah. But when I got into the law firm and I saw that there were not a lot of people that looked like me there. You know, I was one of two African-American attorneys that started the year I started. Um, there was one other that was there. At the time, no African-American associate had been promoted to partner. Male or female? Male or female. Wow. And I was the first one to get promoted to partner in 2014. I knew that I need to do something more than just sit at my desk and bill hours every day. And there was a bigger impact in staying at the firm and practicing law. What would you say was one of the biggest challenges you had to overcome? Getting comfortable with being the only one in the room. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that has been my experience. I mean, during electrical engineering, right. yeah. no one <laughs> necessarily yeah. looks like me in the classroom when I was going through that. Um, but I got used to it and it helped me create a space where I could thrive. And I'm doing this so others behind me do not have to be the only one in the room anymore. If you could, I know it's difficult, but let's say you were talking to the 12 year old version of you and everything you now know that you had to go through, what would you say to the 12 year old version of you? I would tell myself to speak up earlier than I started speaking up. 
When I was younger, you know, I was the girl who was very polite. I was quite shy. I only spoke when spoken no. to. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> now you see me talking all over the place. Um, but I remember after like practicing for four years, my mentor told me, he's like, Chris, you need to talk up during meetings. And someone, I had an experience where a summer associate, someone younger than me noticed it too. And she asked me, she said, Krista, is it normal for associates not to speak during meetings? And that was like a light bulb moment. Like, oh my goodness, I am shielding myself from being my authentic self at the office. And when I realized that, I kind of changed my course and really brought Krista to the table mm -hmm. every day. And I think if I had started doing that earlier, what else could I have accomplished? So I tell everyone now, bring your authentic self yeah. every day, the yeah. first day. It's great advice. Now, yeah. see, I never had a problem speaking up, obviously. I know. I mean, you've been on the radio. And yeah, I had like, to find a way to get paid for the amount of talking that I did. Yeah, or I was just going to be, you know, lost somewhere in the world. But I was so different than you. I think people are so fortunate. I, I still remember my dad told me when I was graduating college and I still didn't know exactly what I wanted to do, he told me I was rudderless. <laughs> and I was so upset by that because I thought, you know, he was different. He was how you were. He knew from a very young age what he wanted to do for a living. And I think it's you're almost in a more difficult position when you're in college and kind of going through experiences and you don't know exactly what you want to do. And I've always kind of lived my life in a way that I say, well, you got to try a lot of things, right? Like that's kind of advice I give to women when they're trying to heal from a breakup or just in general. I say, you kind of got to throw it all against the wall and see what sticks, you know? And so that's kind of how I took the approach in college. I did a lot of things. I mean, I knew I loved to talk. But I didn't know that that was going to land me on the radio. You yeah. know, I actually had applied to do some TV news reporting out of college. But every station that was going to hire me told me I had to cut all my hair off real short. And I, of course, was so independent. I was like, well, I'm not going to do that. Why is you know, that? Find, I don't know. They just wanted a more conservative look, I guess, than what I was giving. But I always stayed really true to myself, you know, no matter what. And I thought, well, I'll figure out another creative job that allows me to be more me. And I'm really glad it just happened to land me in a radio position, which was wonderfully authentic. I know yeah. you talk about that because I was able to write my own content, be, you know, be myself. I think when a lot of people meet people that are on the radio, they go, wow, like you sound the same. And yeah. I go, yeah, because most of us aren't, it's really hard to fake a personality, you know, five days a week for over a decade. Mm -hmm. So sometimes you're an amplified version of yourself, but you definitely have to speak up and kind of find your moment. And I'm really glad that I had that kind of career path myself because I think doing all of those things kind of gave me the confidence that I never would have had to start a business and, you know, out of college or in my twenties, I wouldn't have had that discipline, you know, mm -hmm. having to get up at 3.30 or 4 a.m. Yeah. every day all those years and just kind of learn the ropes of how to manage people and situations. And so that really gave me confidence to start my own thing. And you were on the radio for how long before 13. moving on to finish? 13, 13. years. Okay. And then I toggled both. So I think that was what was most difficult. You know, a lot of women will write me and say, I'm, I'm miserable. I think so many of us get really complacent in life, right? But I think the fear of leaving a stable job keeps us at bay. Absolutely. Like, you know, it keeps you and holds you back from doing something that you never really know what's on the other side of that fear unless you try. And so I toggled both jobs for two years so I could keep putting all the money back into the business, keep taking my steady salary because I had a lot of fear there. I always thought one day I would wake up and I would go, this is it, I'm done. This is the time I'm gonna leave. And I never got to that place. I got to about 75% certainty that it was a good idea, you know, and I thought, I mean, my mom's always been so supportive of me. You know, I grew up an only child. So like, I could tell her right now, I want to go try out for American Idol. I'm a terrible singer. She'd be like, <laughs> so, you know, she was blindly supportive of me, which was great. You know, my dad was more, how much money have you saved? You're going to leave this radio job you've worked so hard for. And I just felt in my gut, I was like, I have to try this, right? So yeah, after about two years of burning the candle at both ends, I thought, well, you know, what's the worst that can happen? You know, the business fails, like a lot of businesses do, and I still have a skill set that I can go back to. So, you know, I try to tell women that want to start something, they go, start small, right? Keep yeah. your job. You know, we all make time for the things we want to do. Start something small. That's and good. if you feel that burning fire inside of you, mm -hmm. you know, and you can manage to at some point leave the full-time job mm -hmm. to do that, you know, mm -hmm. then that's kind of the best of both worlds. Yeah. So. I mean, you talk about the fear of leaving. I actually experienced something opposite at my firm. You know, I've told you I've been at the firm for 17 years and at there, I came to a point where I thought, you know what, I probably should do something different and consider going to a company or potentially going to another firm. Mm -hmm. And I got to the place where I decided to do something. And 
after I told people at the firm I was going to do it, they tried to convince me to stay. Of course. And I actually went through a time period where I had a fear of staying. Mm -hmm. And if I had not stayed, the trajectory and the impact that I would have would not be the same. And staying actually put me in a place where I am having a bigger impact with the people at my firm and more broadly in the industry. So I had to get over that fear now. What was the catalyst to get you to stay? Um, I looked at my mentor who had been with me since my first year of law school, and he was actually an adjunct professor at SMU's law school. So I knew him from that early time. And when I talked to him and my husband, he was a huge part of this conversation and decision. He was like, look at what Bart has done and what he sees in you. And Bart saw something in me that quite honestly, I didn't see it in myself. And trusting in him and you know, trusting my husband's kind of gut reaction to, that got me to the place where I took the leap and I stayed. And it created opportunities that really I could not have dreamed of. And Bart continues to be kind of a catalyst in my life to this day. Yeah, that's amazing. Mentors are so important, you know, and I think people struggle, especially in what we've gone through in the last year to find in person yeah. mentors. And I had read somewhere once and it was just such kind of a light bulb moment for me. You don't have to know your mentor. That's right. Your mentor can be a stranger. You know, you can actually just read, you know, maybe it's an author that's in your same line of work or something like that. And they've written books about it. So you can kind of follow along with their journey and that can be a mentor mm -hmm. for you. And that's kind of what I had to do. I mean, I didn't know yeah. anyone that was on the radio that then started a skincare business. So I just kind of had to look for, you know, maybe other women that had started businesses that were really vocal about their entrepreneurial journey. And that really helped me because you learn about people's almost failures yeah. and it gives you so much more confidence to keep going. So did you have different mentors from your radio days to where you have now? And like, how did you find sure, your Sure. But you know, the host of the radio show I was on for years passed away. And I mean, and he was the greatest mentor ever. So what do you do when the host right. of this person that you look up to and have a great relationship with that you kind of base your every day on, you know, mm -hmm. passes away? I mean, that's definitely one of those moments of, oh my gosh, am I going to be lost now? Yeah. And then you kind of learn, well, I've, some skills have been instilled in me and that advice. And then, yeah, you have to look, you have to look elsewhere. Um, and that's kind of when I started shifting gears and thinking mm. about what the next step would be uh, for me in my life. So that was almost a catalyst for you. Sure. To switch and now to completely move full hog into fetish. Yeah, I think that, well, what do they say? You know, try and make plans. And then, <laughs> like, you can't make real plans for your life no matter what you're doing, because things always change. You know, at the time before he had passed away, I had actually, and I don't think a lot of people know this, I was going to take a job in Los Angeles at mm. a kind of an entertainment news show. Mm. And no one really knows that. But when that happened, it kind of pulled, something pulled me back back to Dallas and I wanted to kind of continue, you know, continue doing the show for a while. And it was amazing. It just felt right. When for years I had been kind of angling to leave and go on and do something else in that field, I never in a million years would have thought that I would have ended up where I was, you know? So I think sometimes it's just kind of about letting life lead you and then going through that open door or open window and seeing, you know, I never thought I would be here, I mean, Finish started his workout program. So yeah. I always tell people, I didn't know exactly. You don't have to have that idea exact. You just have to kind of start figuring it out. So now it's workout programs, it's skincare. I don't like to work out that I much. Mean. I don't like to work out that much anymore. <laughs> no, it was just a way to test the market, you know, and see if people were interested because it was more about the lifestyle, right? Mm. It was about, you know, working out a little bit and not feeling guilty, right? So it's always been for me about kind of conveying to women and men that that balance is a good thing, that yes. we're so inundated with health and fitness that this was about being fit-ish, right? Yeah. So it was a real authentic part of my identity and then it morphed into this topical skincare uh, and that was that. You talk about, you know, never make plans, which is such an important thing, I think, to keep in mind as a mom. Like, I am a control person, no. type A to the <laughs> next. I don't know if you can tell. Um, but I had to really learn in this journey of motherhood with my three kiddos now that the plans I make may not be what they want. Right. And as a mom, you're, you, a lot of times you are responding to the moment and what is in front of you. And I've really had to learn throughout my 14 years of motherhood that I have to be flexible and adjust and manage my expectations when, you know, I get up in the morning, I have a list of things to do. Well, someone just woke up sick and how am I going to now 
manage through that and manage my expectations. And that has been just a great lesson that I've now been able to apply in so many aspects, right? With work, when I get a client call at 8 p.m. and they need something done by 8 a.m., you know? And so it's really helped me to understand. It, it's helped me grow in so many different areas because I've learned to do that. You know, I think a woman that's in my stage of life, you know, I'm just now kind of on the precipice of starting my own family. And I think looking at someone like you, you seem like superwoman to me because you have the successful career, the side hustle, three children at home. How, I mean, what kind of advice would you give someone like me who's at just a slightly earlier stage and how to maybe balance it or just the expectations I should have? Yeah, so one thing I would say is it's not really a balance. Every day is an opportunity to learn and grow. And, you know, when I first started practice, I was like juggling one ball, right? And I was just trying to keep that ball in the air. And now I have like 50 balls that I'm juggling. And it's not a balance, it's a juggle and trying to keep all the balls in the air. So I think if you learn to kind of get out of the space of trying to make it this balance equilibrium, because it never is, I think that helps your um, response when something happens, right? Like, and that's what I'm talking about, managing my own expectations and managing your own expectations that baby is not gonna look like he just came out of the catalog for the gap. Yeah. Baby may just have a onesie lunch. on, yeah. right. <laughs> I feel like my baby's gonna be naked. <laughs> <laughs> And baby is alive, baby is fed and has milk. You know what? You did your thing that day. <laughs> so I think that has really helped me to kind of manage what is okay, right? It doesn't have to be perfect, which that's another thing I have struggled with is, mm -hmm. you know, perfectionism and getting to the place where while it seems like, oh, I'm superwoman, no. I am going back and forth, but I have so many supporters that I work with. My family is so instrumental. My sister, my parents, my aunt who helped us raise our kids for 14 years while, you know, I was traveling and on the road. That's what allows me to follow my dreams and to make an impact in other places because of that support around me. So definitely you need the support system. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm gonna get to work on that. <laughs> <laughs> now, is your mom here in town she with is. you? She is. See, now that's great. She is. Yeah, she's she's in town, so she'll be helpful for sure. Well, she, her name's Candy, and so when I've asked her what I want her grandma name to be, she goes Candy. She's like, that's I think perfect. Candy's a good name. She goes, but I don't want to be full time grandma. I was like, yeah. oh really? You're already cutting out, so I'm gonna probably need more help than that. Yeah. Okay, so you need to have that conversation early, right? So y'all yeah. can both set expectations. <laughs> And then you won't be upset when Candy is going out for the night. <laughs> yeah. Right? <laughs> All right, I'll get on that. <laughs> yeah. So one thing that I've had to work through is like with my parents, like my mom has Parkinson's disease. Mm. And so she's not able to necessarily help in that way. Mm -hmm. But finding, you know, how can we still make this village work with yeah, and all still those bond. other things? Yes. Yeah, I bet that is a challenge. Yeah. And it's funny now that I have a 14-year-old, a 12-year-old, and a 9-year-old, I'll tell them, okay, you're going to go to Mimi's house and you're going to actually watch Mimi yeah, to make sure she's okay. Her. That's right. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So right now I have to tell you, you know, with our building side projects, my husband and I, we are about to build a house for my parents Wow! and they bought a lot, Jenna, two blocks from us. I am so excited. So, so you love that. Yeah. Yes, yeah. Yes. I, well, I never know. Some people don't want the parents too close. Oh no, we are excited. Like we've already started to figure out the walking route so I can just send my kids out the house. Like go to Mimi's and don't come back. Amazing. <laughs> So how many houses have you and your husband built to date? So this next house will be our fifth project. Wow. Um, we had a house in Lakewood in East Dallas, and we did some fixing up to it, but then we bought a house in Forest Hills in 2013, and we decided to renovate it. We hired a contractor, ended up having to do it ourselves, and I remember my husband called me one day, and he was like, well, you know, you thought we were just going to add a second story, but... I'm out here with the demo guys and we're just gonna tear down the house. And I said, okay. I came back to the house that afternoon after work, house is gone. So that started our first project and we did a new construction and love living there. It was like East Coast yeah. vibe, really cool and relaxed. And then 
Fast forward four years later, I was driving home one day and I saw that a lot in our neighborhood was about to go on the market. I get home, I tell my husband, call the real estate agent now, I wanna go see that house. The next day we go see the house, we put a contract on on Monday, we sell our house within a week, and then we are moving on to the next project. And so my husband told me, one, I can't drive and look at any lots yeah. anymore. <laughs> but you're living in your builds and then selling them and doing That's the right. next one. Yes, yeah. Right. So we finished that project in 2020, and now we've been in for you know a little under a year, and it's been so fun. Yeah. I bet it's hard to leave the houses that you put so much work into, though. Um, I think it's harder for my husband. Mm -hmm. Uh, I see it as an opportunity to just do something fun and different. And the kids are totally bought into, like, this is part of their growing up mm -hmm. and getting to build houses with us. Like, they're you know, fancy gypsies now. Yes. <laughs> like, we, although we have, we put them to work too. Yeah. So when we were doing this house, we were doing the outside landscaping, and my husband's on a bobcat. The kids are out there shoveling gravel. It's like, we're, this is a family project, y'all. You want to live in the house? You're going to do some work to get in the house too. See, I've learned so much from you today because you always bring up the word opportunity. So when, instead of the word challenge, yes. you always do that. And I love that. So right. thank you. That's a good way to frame things. It's like things. reframing yeah. your perspective, yeah. right? Yeah. I love that. You know, you talk a lot about opportunity instead of using the word challenge. And I think that makes you such a trailblazer. I mean, you obviously are considering you were what the only African-American woman to get promoted to partner in your law firm. Well, you know, I never use that word for myself, but as I look through my experiences, there are a lot of firsts, right? You know, I said I was the first African-American associate to be promoted to partner in our Dallas office. Well, now I'm the first African-American to have a firm white leadership role as deputy chair of my department and the first African-American woman to be on the executive committee now. And while I'm doing that, the point is to not be in a place where there's still first happening, right? So when I had my daughter nine years ago, as soon as she was born, I looked at her and I said, you're gonna be a patent attorney. And as I go through these stages, <laughs> I think that I know, that's me. OCD, right? Yeah, type A. Um, what if she wants to dance? <laughs> no, she's gonna be a patent attorney. So as I think through that, in 15 years, right, when she's at a law firm, I don't want her to be the second or the third. I want it to be normal to have yeah. an African-American woman that's a patent attorney that is going towards partnership and has a seat at the table. And so I really want to use all of the spaces I'm in to provide opportunity for those that are coming behind me. Yeah, that's incredible. You know, I looked really hard for women that had, because what I did was a pivot, right? right? And so that's kind of what I looked for to give me the motivation to then try to be my own trailblazer, but to try and do the pivot, right? The art of the pivot's kind of tough because there's a lot of women like you who knew from the age of 12 what they wanted to do. But when you don't know, and then you want to make a sudden career change later in life, it can be really scary, you know? But luckily, I feel that there's a lot of great female entrepreneurs out there with, you know, great stories that, you know, kind of spent the last of their savings to start a business, took way bigger risks than I did. And that made me feel, you know, so much better to kind of do that. And I, I've also used my platform in a way because I have a platform yeah. and there's pressure with a platform and I felt it was always so important to do what you don't see a lot of women with a platform do and use it to show weaknesses mm. vulnerabilities fails you know because like we talk about with the perfect mom you know so many women showcase this sense of perfection and it can just be kind of life ruining right. when you're watching it and you're having a bad day so I think you know I just try to utilize what garnered me success on the radio, which was that I was always honest. You know, I was always authentic. I was just very genuinely myself, talked openly about heartbreak. I've talked really openly about my IVF journey. Mm -hmm. And it was shocking to me going through this because I think um, a lot of women don't share it. There mm -hmm. was so much misinformation, lack of information. And so I just suddenly felt kind of drawn to share, even though it's very difficult yeah. to kind of share that experience. And I have to tell you, I've never in my life from all these years on the radio gotten more of a response from people, men and women on my social media than writing me, talking about IVF, asking me questions, going through their own fertility journey. And I think it just says everything, right? People just want 
honesty, yeah. you know, because we all share a lot of problems and so many people just don't talk about them. I mean, it seems like you've been a trailblazer in your own right with the pivot that you took, right? <laughs> not and, as much as yes, you. Yes, <laughs> and how you're now sharing in a way that may not have been status quo before. And that's awesome to see too. You, sometimes you don't know where your life's going to take you, like mm -hmm. we've talked about. You know, I never thought I'd be end up on the radio with that kind of platform and have a business. And so you just kind of have to go in a direction that you feel compelled. And it's been amazing because actually Avondale's been so supportive, supportive of me and my journey. You know, I've been partnering with them for a while and I, you know, they were one of the first to know that I was leaving my radio show. I go, you also want to work with me <laughs> after I leave the radio show? Do I still have value, you know, as a brand partner yes. to you? And it was so amazing because their response was like, of course, we love the platform you've created. We love that, you know, you stand up for women. That's exactly what we want in a partnership out of you. And it's just been really amazing to carry that on. And our relationship has just turned into something so phenomenal. You know, for me, getting to work with brands in general, I, you know, there's really been nothing like Avondale for me because they care so much about not just here, will you post a photo and promote the brand, but what else are you doing? You know, yes. in terms of philanthropy, for instance, you know, they introduced me to other charities in Dallas, like New Friends, New Life, which I know you've been a part of as well, right? Yes. I mean, and when I saw that intersection with Avondale and New Friends, New Life, I just got really excited because I'm on the board now for New Friends, but I started volunteering there 11 years ago. And I got introduced to New Friends New Life through the Junior League of Dallas, where I started as an active member in the Junior League in 2006. And now in my 15th year, I'm president of the Junior League of Dallas, which is amazing. Wow. Um, and, you know, another kind of first is I'm the first African-American president for of this 100-year organization. When do you sleep? <laughs> when do you sleep? I do. I promise I sleep. I need my sleep. Like three hours, four <laughs> no, hours? A lot of hours. Yeah. So it's really fun to be able to impact not just the business world, but the community, right? Yep. In a different way and to create an opportunity for all people mm -hmm. to participate in different avenues of life. So, you know, I've tried to use my platform in terms of philanthropy to kind of showcase all the wonderful organizations there are, you know, around the DFW area, because I didn't even know about New Friends, New Life until Avondale introduced me. And I think it just says a lot that sometimes you just need to kind of disseminate that information. So I feel really proud to have that platform platform and use it in a positive way a lot of the time. And I carried over something we used to do on the radio was, uh, you know, we would do these Christmas wishes. So, you know, when you have a platform like that, people nominate families and then we would try and grant these wishes. And so when I told uh, the staff at Avondale that that's kind of something I was just interested in doing, I wasn't sure how they'd receive that since it wasn't kind of an organized, you know, charitable situation. Mm -hmm. But this is something I wanted to do because I still get a lot of people writing me about, you know, nominating people in their life that really have just had a, you know, downturn of luck in their lives. So we've been doing that the last couple of years around the holiday. And it's just been amazing to try and, you know, use my audience as a way right. here. You just, you want to help, but here's a way that you can help. So yeah. it's just been really, really wonderful because what good is a platform if you're not using it? That's for good? right. So I have to tell you a secret because I have listened what? to okay. Kit 106.1 <laughs> all the time. And I will say when you were doing the Christmas wishes, I was basically crying the whole week. Right. It was so mm -hmm. emotional and so impactful just what we think may be a small thing, mm -hmm. what it really can do. And when we think about, you know, using our platforms, mm -hmm. our opportunities to really impact others, I mean, what better way to really change the world and make a difference? Perspective will do a lot for you sometimes, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. It's That's all about right. perspective. Yeah, we've talked about that a lot today. Yeah. Our own and others too. Well, I'd love to get your perspective on building a home for myself. <laughs> you got that, Jetta. You're going to be my next client, I think. Let's get out of here. Maybe we can find some other Perfect. ideas in here. This has been great. Let's do it. Thank you for joining us on this episode of Intersections, an Avondale Originals podcast for elevated conversations. If you'd like to see more from our guests and the cars featured in this episode, check out the video series on Avondale Dealership's YouTube channel. Questions, comments, or suggestions for future guests? Email us at intersections at avondale.com. Want to check out the cars from this episode and more? Visit Avondale dealerships at avondale.com to browse our collection of luxury cars. Until the next time.